pleased to present Mr. Suhail Seth to you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for having me. I never imagined I'd come to Indore ever in my life, but I'm glad I changed that, or you helped me change that uh, situation. Somehow, you know, it's not part of my beat, but driving from the airport to the hotel, seeing the cleanliness, which when I tweeted, I was told it was all done for the Global Investors Summit. At least it's done for some reason. Uh, and then when I saw all the reading material which was sent to me by Rachna on, on what the IMA has done, it's pretty impressive. The topic today is topical, tenable, and important given what's happening and what has particularly happened this evening at 4 o'clock in Delhi. Does corporate India crawl when asked to walk? And I'm going to largely tell you stuff as I always do straight off the bat. I know there are members of the press, uh, but the media in India is also as free as it chooses to be. So, you know, they are not any holier than corporate India is, and I believe they know that with aplomb and graciousness. So here's where we are today. I think we're living in the worst possible times that India has ever been through for three reasons. Number one, the average Indian has lost confidence in the idea of India. I've always said there are three kinds of citizens, the engaged, the enraged, and the indifferent. From 1930 to 1947, India had engaged citizens. They were engaged with the cause of freedom that Mahatma Gandhi espoused so brilliantly. From 1947 to about 1971, 72, we were indifferent until the war again brought back elements of pride. And then Indira Gandhi was foisted on us in a hapless manner. Came the emergency, came her two little boys, and ever since the country has been downhill for a large part until Narasimha Rao stepped in and we saw the first wave of liberalization. At that point in time, the Indian citizen became engaged all over again. But for the last four years, we've been an angry society. Rage is not a mo an emotion that augurs prosperity. Rage is a self-destroying emotion. It's an emotion that eats within you. It prevents progress. It harms uh, people from moving forward. And it encourages cynicism. And that is what we've become today. A largely cynical society, pessimistic to the large part, only because of the kind of leadership we've had. And the leadership is not only political. The leadership is in the corporate world. The leadership is in the social world. The leadership is all around. And we have to ask ourselves a question. What kind of democracy predicts future prime ministers? We do. What kind of a country whose average age is 30 has a union cabinet whose average age on Sunday dropped to 65.1 years? There is something radically wrong with us. It would be unfair to say that there's something wrong with our politicians. We elect them. And many a time we choose not to vote. And then are the first to argue that, oh my God, why do we have such people in power? The problem is that the management of the idea of India has failed. It's failed for reasons that I will enumerate. You cannot have a country with such a sharp socio-economic divide. You cannot have a country with a divide which is so stark, which prevents people from basic fundamentals. You cannot have an India which talks about 6% growth and has, to my mind, 42% of India without any basic level of sanitation or water. Jairam Ramesh was right. He very rarely is. He was right. This country needs toilets, not temples. It is ironic that a country which had embraced liberalism under Jawaharlal Nehru has today become embroiled in religiosity. I'm not a good person to talk on religion. I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. I believe the absence of science indicates and calls for the presence of God. But you must read a fabulous book by Amartya Sen called The Idea of Justice. And it is reflective of today's India. He argues two basic contentive points. 
Number one, he says there is an inherent difference between justice and fairness. And he uses two Hindi words, Niti and Nyai. Niti is process, Nyai is justice. So all of us may go to a court of law, but there are no guarantees that that court of law will be fair. His second argument is qua God. And he says when Arjun was actually, when Krishna was actually sermonizing Arjun on that chariot on their way towards war, didn't Krishna realize that in the wake of war there'd be orphans and widows, there'd be bloodshed, but he still went ahead. So these are some of the compulsions that are telling on corporate India. I was telling some ladies and gentlemen from the press earlier, corporate India has failed itself. You cannot crawl when you're asked to walk. You cannot be servile. But you only become servile when you have something to hide. And corporate India has a lot to hide. The nexus between corporations and politics has always existed. But today it's become unmanageable. And people are not willing to accept that. Corruption must and will always prevail in any unequal society. Corruption exists across the world. But corruption of this magnitude, where there is brazenness, there is mockery, and there's almost an attitude, I will do what I want to hell with the rest, that is unacceptable. You've also got to understand <coughs> that the young are impatient. The young by nature are anti-establishment. And today, the so-called demographic dividend that we kept speaking about is actually coming back to haunt us. It's the same youth which wants answers, and rightly so. Why, after so many decades of independence, do we still treat our women the way we do? Narendra Modi is a friend of mine. He's not some person I don't know. I was aghast at his comments on Shunanda Tharoor not worthy of a political leader, not worthy of a man who will and should or may become prime minister. The inspirational qualities of our leadership have declined. So last night on NDTV, when asked about Narendra, I said that the quality of political discourse has declined because we've moved away from issues. When you have no real issues, you begin attacking personalities. That's not the way you should do it. Corporate India suffers from the same malaise. There are some iconic corporations in India, as there should be in any society. But by and large, corporate India has always believed that there is a master. The day you label someone a master, you automatically reposition yourself as a slave. And that is the point. By positioning the politician as your ruler, as the master, you have willingly repositioned yourself and they will, as they must, take advantage of that repositioning. The famed Bombay club which Rahul Bajaj Tom Tom, today his company under his son, thank God, is making more money than it's ever made. Corporate India has always played for vested interest, very rarely for national interest. That can't continue because corporate India today is seen almost as terribly by the young as politicians are. And when people lose respect for the corporations that should be the, the drivers of the engines of growth, then it will take a long time for companies to recover. It's not about whether it's true or false. It's about the perception that exists. We have willingly created a perception in India that corporations can manage the politician. And the politician will use the corporations either for political funding or for other stuff. And we've seen that happen. You cannot have a country which has the kind of deficit we do at almost, what, 5%, which has elections which cost so much of money. Nowhere in the world do you spend that kind of money. And if you do, which is roughly, what, $2 billion that Obama and Romney are spending, they're spending it in the world's richest country. And the tragedy is that there are three basic flaws in our democracy which we need to come to terms with. We have crooks and tugs who stand for election because crooks and tugs have access to money. When you have crooks and tugs, you get the kind of parliament we do have today. 
you don't have people being able to talk they're better flinging they're better at flinging microphones so when they come into power and when they have to take decisions look at the pedigree that they come from their decisions are not decisions based on reason their decisions are based on tuggery the second when you have elections that cost that much obviously those guys have to recover money they've got to have return on investment how do they recover money legitimately they can't so they begin to recover money illegitimately so they browbeat corporate india corporate india is unwilling to go to the media unwilling to go to court because you never know what this maibab culture will uh, yield or wield on you so you succumb and the third is that the corporation then tries to hide the realities of that nexus with the result that it digs an even deeper hole for itself to my mind this is the most shameful parable in indian corporate history every corporation needs to have a soul that must tick and a heart that must beat for india the nation it can't only beat for itself to talk about building shareholder value is utter nonsense because you can't build shareholder value if you don't build citizenry respect because it's not the shareholder alone but the citizen who's going to buy your brand which brings me to the other point where i think corporate india has by and large failed <clears throat> i think corporate india has failed in creating an effective conduit for the social compact for giving back to society it's important someone asked me about csr csr to my mind is an abuse it's an excuse because a many, many a time <coughs> csr is done only because you want to curry favor with the government it's done around your plant around your car plant around your steel plant how many corporations in india actually encourage the arts and crafts of india they're going out of the window trust me we will become a country 30 years later people won't know that there was any arts and crafts except louis vuitton that's the kind of culture we're building and if we don't arrest this decline we are creating a self goal for us which is unforgivable how many corporations in india actually support sports <coughs> other than cricket of course so it's not about giving back it's about investing in the idea of india and i think where corporations or indian corporations can and must make the differences if they invest in india and everything that's indian and i'm not talking about rallying around against fdi i think fdi in retail is is a desirable attribute to have because ultimately it's the consumer who must decide and not some joker sitting in some legislature in our states but these are some harsh realities how many corporations condemn riots when they occur how many corporate leaders take a stand anuraga and deepak parekh took a stand on godra and cii forced them to apologize these chambers of commerce are nothing but event management companies whether it's a cii or a fiki absolutely rotten to the core nothing but lobbying chambers but these are the chambers that you guys become members of these are the chambers that hold investor meets with with what level of honesty and credibility and i'm not saying that there's anyone better but look at the kind of india that we are attempting to build this is not going to be the india thank you so much this is not going to be the india that will last the way the india of yesterday did and i want to come back to a favorite topic of mine which is values we've lost the courage to stand up and stand out and that courage is most diminishing in corporate india we don't want to take on the establishment we don't want to stand up for what we believe we don't want to castigate a rogue politician we don't want to object to the extremities of a political climate that is harsh and vindictive because we want the easy way out because we are selfish because we are indulging in crony capitalism and because we believe that why should we take up cudgels on behalf of a nation 
but you are the nation. If corporate India is going to drive revenue, it's going to drive shareholder value, it must become responsible. And in responsibility comes courage. You can't have responsibility without courage. The second area where I believe corporate India, to my mind, has, has let people down is we are taking a far too easy way out as far as education is concerned. Our primary education is in deep, deep distress. We don't realize that, but it is in deep trouble. <coughs> Sorry. The fact that children in our villages have to walk miles on end in today's India is a despicable thing. We need to be ashamed of ourselves. So corporate India needs to reconsider before it bandies about and tom-toms all its good to say, what real change have we brought about for the real people? Two weeks ago, I was addressing the, my alma mater's, the Harvard Club in New York, <clears throat> and someone asked me, what is the single biggest problem of society in today's world? I said, it is not poverty and wealth. It is the denying of opportunities. We in India have denied opportunities to most of our people. When you deny opportunities, you create the kind of inequality that is senseless and enduring, where people can't recover from that inequality. So the debate that most economists get into is a silly debate. It has no intellectual merit. In India, it is not about the poor and the rich. It is about a certain class which has all the opportunities and a certain class which has none. So you stifle them from the time they are born. My entire family, and I'm a bachelor, but my mother, my father, my brother, his two kids, his wife, are deeply religious. I got off religion. I got off religion when I was age 8 or age 10. Because I found it to be divisive, I found it to be cloistered, and I found that we were worshipping some archaic being who was never responsible for all the stuff that happened on planet Earth. I mean, which compassionate human being, if you call him God, would ever condone riots and famines, would condone shipwrecks, would condone tsunamis? But that, to my mind, is another debate. But the fact is, even religion, which is supposed to unite, even religion, which was actually created, and, and you must read another book by Alain de Botton, called Religion for Atheists, where he makes a brilliant argument in the initial pages as to why religion came into being. Do I not go to holy places? Of course I do. I go to the Golden Temple, what, twice, four times a year? But I don't go and, you know, stand in a queue or, I mean, I obviously stand in a queue, but I don't go there to worship anything. I go there for the serenity. Look at, look at where we've brought Hinduism to. Look at where we've brought Sikhism to. Sikhism was created as a religion in order to fight the caste system of Hinduism. And today, they have a caste system within Sikhism. Look at what we are doing with Islam. So if you see the world around us, we live, and the, the reason why I'm giving you this example of religion is, we live in very, very callous times where we are using every straw of hope to further divide society. When you divide societies, you're left with nothing. You're left, as I started by saying, you're left with an abundant amount of rage, which is self-destructive. So where do we go? What do we need to do? Apart from shooting each one of our current members of parliament, we need to overhaul, to my mind, the entire construct of democracy in India. But that will not happen until good people don't get into politics. And good people won't get into politics as long as politics requires that kind of funding. And that kind of funding won't stop if you don't move yourself away from the crippling nexus that you've become part of. And it's easy to be honest. You know, a lot of people tell me, oh, you have no businesses, you know, you're only a consultant, that's why you can abuse the government. No. It's very easy in this country to be honest. We pay amongst the lowest income taxes in the world. So it's not the, the draconian past where we were paying 90% personal income tax. We have very decent people in today's India 
some of whom are in our government today, I don't think India can ever dream of a better and a more honest Prime Minister. And I think people by taking pot, shot, pot shots at Manmohan Singh are not only discrediting him, but more importantly, discrediting the authority and the office of the Prime Minister. So it's all right for Narendra Modi to say Mon Mohan Singh. But you know, comments are comments, but you have to understand that there's an authority linked to that office. We have some very, very good people in Parliament. But do you see the media covering a development speech? No. The media will cover a comment made on Shananda Tharoor. But you ask the same television media or the same print media to actually tell me right now what are the developmental figures in terms of food grain productivity for India, they won't know. You know why? Because they are also in the commercial world. They are no longer in the editorial world. They have got to go back and make sure circulation goes up. That's the reality. In our times, we read editors. Today you see them. I never saw an editor in my life when I was growing up in Calcutta. And the statesman had some of the finest editors. People like S. Nehal Singh. People like Sunanda K. Dattare. You never saw them. Today, you have editors doing Tedi Baat, Tiki Baat, Sidi Baat, all that kind of nonsense. So this is, this is the environment in which we exist. So to get out of this kind of environment is difficult if you lack courage. Not to say, to the media's credit, there have been exposes thanks only to the media. But today certain sections of the media are discredited. So the point I'm making is that in a largely unwaveringly cynical India, what are the things that we need to do? I think corporate India needs to replace its balance sheet with a heart and a soul. And I don't mean it in a cliched form. I mean it in a serious manner. I think corporate India needs to pause and wonder and figure and think about the kind of India they would like to be part of. There are some brilliant corporations, as I said. You look at the Mahindras, you look at the Tatas, you look at the Infosys, you look at the Larson and Two Bros. But look at the way our politicians also treat some of the multinationals. I mean, the treatment meted out to Vodafone is unforgivable. So there are, there are, uh, there's a huge surge of conflict within today's India. The second is, look at the values we are inspiring the young with. You know, every time I'm in Bombay, I walk with a man who you may have heard the dialogues of, but probably not seen him. He's a man called Salim Khan. He's Salman's father. Now you would know who he is. He used to write dialogues many, many years ago. And, oh, he's excellent. I'll tell him, I'll be walking with him on Saturday. So every time I'm in Bombay, I walk on the Bandra bandstand with him. So, and we always talk about life. So one day I asked him, I said, Ye Bharat mein ho kya raha hai? And he says, Suhail ji, ma gaib hai. I said, ma kaise gaib hai? I'll translate for you. I asked, what is happening in this country today? And this very, very eminent film dialogue writer Salim Khan told me, the mother is missing. So I said, how is the mother missing? She's there. He says, no. He says, Hamare zamane mein, agar hum kuch galti karte the, to hum school se wapas aakar unko kehte the ki, maa galti ho gai, maa ek thappad maarti thi, aur kehti thi, agli baar agar karoge, fir mein pita ji ko kahungi. Which means, if we made a mistake, we come back from school and tell the mother that we made a mistake, and the mother would give us a slap and say, don't do it again, otherwise the next time I'll tell your dad. Then he went on to say, But aaj, jab phone aata hai, aur bachya phone uthata hai, aur dousri taraf koi maa se baat karna chaati hai, to maa bolti hai, bol do, maa ghar mein nahi hai. To your inspiring lies in deceit, which basically today if someone calls and the little child picks up, the mother from the back says, tell them I'm not home. So you're encouraging the child to lie. The second point he made very interesting. He said in the good old days when you would pass someone's house and the guy was corrupt, you'd look and you'd have a disgusting look. Today you look in admiration. That's the difference. 
so when you build an india where values are going to be replaced by economic prosperity alone then you're in trouble i was asked by lots of channels about antilla and you know mukesh's house and all i'm absolutely fine with it it's built from personal money people have a right to do what they do i'm delighted that neeta also supports so many social causes including india's only newspaper in braille something that people don't know but when you actually look at the entire canvas why are we worried about people's wealth in india we are worried about people's wealth in india for two sociological reasons we've always been an envious society envy has been our birthmark that's why they say the famous indian crap story the second is we've created a very polarized divided uneconomic unequal society in the light of that i would offer four solutions for corporate india number 1 start supporting causes not through checkbook philanthropy but literally from don't support them for one year two years 10 years plant seeds of investment of support the second declare vested interest if and when vested interest is sought number 3 you must be considering yourselves and you must imagine that every corporation in india is both a brand ambassador within and a brand ambassador outside india because the damages that it causes us today within india get reported internationally in a media borderless world and finally build people we've stopped building people we've stopped going to schools and colleges and talking to them about life today when i i hardly address schools and colleges anymore but the brief or the limited occasions i do i always ask them which is the last book you've read and it's almost inevitably a textbook you can't pass through this world without smelling the flowers or without knowing names of the trees you can't because you can't enjoy it you can't pass through this world without reading everything that our parents taught us we are dismissing with every passing day a lot of people say oh you you know you've done this you've done that what is the success i said two things one read 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 until you're dead number two be blunt 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 until someone kills you thank you so much arvind pujari's question your take on arvind kejriwal's expose today on reliance government nexus i think arvind kejriwal has become a weekly inquisitor you know people in india are tired of every time negativity 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 all the stuff that he said today on television has been in the public domain is there a nexus i don't know what is going to happen i don't know where is kejriwal headed i don't think even he knows so you know this constant barrage see i keep telling people it's not important to tell me or tell you that she is wrong no politicians win elections by telling you how bad the other guy is they win elections by telling you how good they are or what they will do and arvind kai kejriwal hasn't still spoken about what he's going to do he's told me everything that's wrong with india i want to figure out what the hell are you going to do to change that wrong and time will tell ashok inani two groups actually the question is which business group have you come across closest to not crawling when asked to walk i think two i would say ratan tata anand mahendra never i mean i'm not saying this because both are clients but i know of many instances when they walked away ratan tata could have done a deal with uh, mamta banerji on singur there were many offers he said no i know for a fact i'll i'll give you a small example i advised the taj group and i was one day touring taj lands end in bombay and i saw this amazing terrace space so i called the gm and i said i want the chambers here you know an equivalent of the chambers that we have everywhere else and the gm said sure the chambers was ready in 14 months it took another 21 months 
for it to open because they refused to bribe the BMC guys in terms of licensing. So, you know, now have they ever not cheated? I don't know. I don't hold a candle for anyone. But by and large, they're clean. Max, I mean, I'm sure there are many, many clean companies. You know, to say that there are only two or three would be incorrect. I'm only telling you of examples that one knows. I don't know about the rest. <laughs> we are with you in shooting the MPs. Where do we start, Manish? Look, I just meant it as a joke. I don't want to go up, go to court again, say, oh, did you, this is treason and all. Nowadays, they arrest people for tweets. Can you imagine what they'll do to me? Uh, are there any more questions? Just ask you, I don't write. Oh. So, good evening, sir. Uh, how do you think that more accountability can, brought, can be brought about in our system? And what is it that the youth of our country can, can contribute in it in a, in a small way and whatever way? I think the youth must be decent, inspirational, imbibe certain cultured values. We don't want you to become Mother Teresa. Just be decent human beings and be proud of your citizenship. Okay. So, you know, for the youth to suddenly believe, oh, will we change India and all? You won't change India. You will change first yourself in order to change India. And many a time we are damn good at giving lectures on what the others should do, but we will lead our lives, you know, with all the muck and the chaos. So I think where you guys should start is actually, as I said, read more, be proud of the legacy you've inherited, and don't screw it up. Um, so, well, right here, the back. Uh, as a true backbencher, here's my comment on something you said about absence of Ma. Probably you could go back to Salim Bhai and tell him that, uh, uh, yes, there's absence of Ma, and then there's a presence of Sasu Ma these days. Sure. Why don't you tell Ekta Kapoor that? Hi, Suhan. Uh, this is Jitesh. I just wanted to know, is there a uh, spirituality, the way to treat this uh, flaws in the corporate world? Can spirituality be the way? As you said, you're an atheist, but you're a spiritual man, right or wrong? No, I'm not. You're not a spiritual The only man. spirits I have is when the bar is open. <laughs> Look, can I be honest? Now, you know, I don't want to get into trouble with all of this. I don't believe in all the spiritual stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, satsang and Sri Sri and, mm -hmm. you know, hugging saint and all that. That's my personal view. I think it's a waste of time. It's a club for divorced wealthy women. I don't want to go there. I mean, I'm sorry if I hurt your thing. You know, I'm not a believer. So just let me be. Don't talk about spirituality and all. Because I have seen once Ravi Shankar, I refused to call him Sri Sri. Ravi invited me to some gathering of his. I said two things. One is I'm not going to take off my shoes. But I'm in a suit and I'm not going to sit on the ground. So he says, we'll get you a chair. And it was one of these very, you know, obtuse kind of things. I didn't understand what the hell he was saying, but everyone seemed to be in agreement with him. And uh, <clears throat> I got up, he said, what did you think? I said, you know, one and a half hours wasted. And as I was getting out towards my car, there were two women actually fighting. I think they call him Guruji or Swamiji or whatever. No, he has to come to my house. No, he has to come to my house. So much for spirituality and peace. The guy's just delivered a lecture for one and a half hours. There are two women fighting as to where he'll go next. So, you know, I think we make too much of spirituality. I would much rather you read one interesting man. Read a guy called Jiddu Krishnamurti. You know, and he's not spiritual. These are philosophers. Look, I'm a great believer. I must understand the world through rationality and logic. I can't understand the world through white flowing robes, long hair, you know, art of living, art of dying, art of killing, art of giving. That's silly for me. <clears throat> I'm too rational. That's why, you know, it's difficult for people like us to even fall in love. We are always saying, oh God, so much of a waste. I mean, in a manner of speaking. So, you know, I think <clears throat> in India we make too much of a fetish of spirituality. We suddenly say, oh yeah, Banda is spiritual. Hai. He'll go out rob the next bank, defraud his business partner, but he'll still be very spiritual. So, you know, I'm, I'm against that. I mean, that's a very, very personal view. There you are. 
See, she just said, you guys are the most corrupted, not you guys, but spirituality. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I'm saying yes. Indians is the only way of making India less corrupt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a non so <laughs> Uh, what is your idea on the social enterprising concept? I think it's wonderful. There are some outstanding people who are getting involved. There's a guy called Ashish Dhawan, who was one of the finest venture capitalists in India, he used to run a company called Chrysalis, and has now become a social entrepreneur. See, I've always said that what you and I call charity and what Manu 3,700 years ago in the scriptures in Manu Smriti called Daan, there are two kinds of philanthropy. One is where you give. The other is you give and make that give back to itself. What we now call sustainable philanthropy. And I think more and more social entrepreneurs should be encouraged. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great thing and, and, and a country like ours needs it. And this is where I must compliment some of the young people. Today more and more young people are going into this domain rather than what you and I would, you know, do in the, in the defined staccato domains in the past. I don't. No. Now, yeah, good question. I'm often asked this, oh, but you move in urban domain and all that. I spend at least five working days in what you and I would call between class three tier towns and villages. When is the last time you went to a village? A village village where there's no electricity, there's no sanitation. Okay, where you and I have to go into the field if we want to do whatever we have to do. The tragedy is when you see that kind of India, you realize the dichotomousness of our society. That's why I use the phrase denial of opportunity. Many years ago, the government of India asked me, obviously, and I said I'd do it for free, <laughs> under the National Literacy Mission to study the midday meal school concept. And we discovered, I mean, they told me that, look, we're having lots of problems with young girls coming in. They come in, but then at about age 11, 12, they disappear. We figured that as soon as they achieve, attain puberty, there were issues with respect to toilets. All we did was we created segregated toilets and 47% of the departed women, I mean not departed as in dead, but as in people who left school, came back. So if you understand the essence of society in India, it works. Please also look at farmhand deployment in India. Do you know? 72% of children between the ages of 8 and 14 are used as farmhand, not necessarily to <clears throat> plow the cattle, but more importantly to run errands between the home and the farm. If you look at the Banaras Weaver, which now the Taj has revived, and you look at the ailments there, you're looking at children who work the spindles between 7 and 12. What kind of a country are we building? It is important to, for us to retain the arts and crafts. But where do we give subsidies? We give subsidies to SUV guzzling vehicles. We don't give subsidies to our craftsmen. And I think Sonia Gandhi has created the biggest disservice in India by launching Narega. You've created an army of people who don't have to work for 100 days. It's like being on a, on a government dole. And the corruption within Narega is equally enormous. So I'm saying... You know, the tragedy is, <clears throat> whether it is our media, whether it is people who write in our newspapers, we've stopped becoming a philosophical thinking society. If you go to dinners today, people will ask you the stupidest questions. Or, yaar, kaan ja rahe ho? Holiday kaise tha? There's no meaningful conversation. When was the last time you went to a dinner and you discussed a book? So all the things that we used to do in the past, we have replaced with nonsense, with trivia. 
we don't have conversations anymore. Aldous Huxley, another brilliant mind of the 20th century said, there is a difference between the cognitive and the non-cognitive. We have become a nation which is involved in hearing, but not listening. Hearing will happen if you have ears. Listening will happen if you have the intellect, the desire to imbibe. And we've stopped that. So, you know, rather than the Ravi Shankar and the hugging saint or whatever her name is and all the other ma this, ma that, rather than give us stupid lectures on how to love thy neighbor and, you know, ensnare someone's happily married wife, they should actually be talking about the basics that are missing in our society. We don't respect our parents anymore in the manner we used to. All this nonsense of Valentine's Day and Father's Day and Mother's Day and you know, all this rubbish. We weren't brought up in that cultural idiom. You cannot transplant Western ideology on a country that essentially emerged from certain core values. We fail to realize that. And this is not true only of India. It's true of America. For people in America to have a debate on the Hamishes, on the Mormons, is silly. Because that is their way of life. It is equally silly to be demeaning towards uh, people within our own country. We are hugely, intrinsically casteist and racist. Everything south of India is Madrasi. So, you know, you, this only happens when there is lack of knowledge. And in India, the sad thing is, we believe education is equal to knowledge. Education is equal to a degree. Knowledge is something that is unending, enduring, and never ever should it fulfill you. There should be divine discontent in the quest for knowledge. And that is something we are missing. You see it in our debates, you see, you know, I, I mean, I don't spend that much of time here, but let's say if you're judging a debate, and even it's the Mukherjee Memorial at St. Stephen's, standards have fallen. You know, we used to have fun in debating. There's a certain art. I mean, this afternoon while driving to uh, Delhi airport, I was having a long conversation with a mad friend of mine, Mani Shankar Ayer, who again is a brilliant debater. And we were both mourning the loss of debating skills. We're not creating orators anymore. We're not creating great public speakers. Because our conversations are limited. In Delhi, everyone says, what's up? How do you respond to a stupid comment like, what's up? If this is your conversation, or if, if you're in, let's say in the hinterland, you walk in and the guy says, or kya ho yaar? And it is not because they don't have the capacity to converse. It's because they don't have the confidence. And they don't have the confidence because what they've done is we are creating cookie cutter human beings out of India. So all these jokers will follow the same education route, same thing, get married, burn a wife or two, be adulterous, and then go happily on. And you know, and look at the society. There are guys who go to jail, they come out, they are celebrated. So unless society itself becomes intolerable of such devious human frailty, you will never build a robust society which imbibes or which emerges from this cauldron of respect and love. And that's what we're doing. When was the last time you wrote a handwritten note? No. Today you get an invitation over a text message. Someone is dead, he informs you over the phone. Sorry, father died, prayer ceremony. So, you know, I'm saying this whole idiom to my mind has to change. Sir, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, do you think, sir, th it is possible in this country to do business fearlessly without the support of politicians and bureaucrats? Yeah, look at the information technology business the IT business, the biosciences business, by and large the pharma businesses, wherever you require a brain, remember the politician will never get involved. Wherever you require resources, he'll get involved. I'm not being facetious. Think this comment through later at night. Wherever brains are required, the politician stays away. Wherever land, resources, mining, coal, he'll get in. So do things that require a brain, because then he'll stay far away. 
he or she. Sir, I would like to refer the uh, infamous uh, Radia tapes where the top-notch uh, corporates of India were involved. And, uh, I mean, including me. I spoke to Neera, uh, what's her name? Neera, Neera, Neera Radia. What's the harm? I spoke to her, but thank God I was fast asleep when she called me. Look, she was advising Ratan Tata, Mukesh Ambani. She's a PR person. Who else is she going to talk to? A janitor? Is she going to talk to, uh, you know, a film actor? She's obviously going to talk to uh, journalists. And everyone, you know, this is the other beauty about India. So no one wanted to own up. This happened on the 14th of October, two years ago. And I remember Arnob called me, Arnob was a friend of mine. He says, oh, will you come on the show? Because and all of them had spoken to Arnob, Rajdeep, everyone. So I said, of course I'll come on the show. So with me was Vinod Mehta who had exposed it in Outlook. So I told Vinod, I said, see, the reason why Neera Radia doesn't talk to you is for two reasons. A, you're too old. You have a hearing problem. He does. B, your magazine hardly sells. So why the hell would she call you? I said, so you're just simply jealous. And then I asked him, I said, who else is she supposed to call? Yes. If she has attempted to fix the government, which apparently she made comments to Barkha and all that, I'll fix this minister or that minister, haul them up, send them to jail. She's never spoken to me. But I said, I said, if she's committed a crime, send her to jail. But the government goes and does a deal. So I'm a great believer, you commit a crime, go to jail. From December 1, I'm personally launching a campaign. If you're found with drugs, kill these guys, hang them. Because we are creating the biggest drug country in the world. Today, more people have cocaine in Delhi than they have Coca-Cola. And it's the rich, it's the powerful, they have it because they believe they can get away. So I've convinced one of the channels to run this campaign saying death for the druggy. Well, unless you hang a couple of people, this country will not learn lessons. Sir, one more question. Uh, so do you think is it will be possible in India to have that uh, Rajat Gupta kind of justice for corporate fraud? I don't know, but interesting. Google it. I was the only Indian who wrote and spoke against Rajat Gupta. Fifteen Indian top honchos wrote letters favoring him. And I was asked by the Financial Times in London, and I said, this man is unforgivable, send him to jail. And I'm glad, I'm only sad that he's got two years. Rajat Gupta should have got 11 years, if not more. People say, why didn't he, why did he get less than Raj Ratnam? He deserved more. When you violate the sanctity of a board directorship, when you violate trust, being as bright and as intelligent and as compassionate as you supposedly are, you need to be given a harsher punishment. Because there is no bigger crime than the betrayal of trust which has been reposed in you. It's like you're going to a doctor who instead of healing you, amputates your arm. There is no bigger betrayal. Now whether we will have that justice system, God alone knows. Yeah. I don't think it will happen in my lifetime. It may happen in yours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. One, one question. If you were in the being place of Manmohan Singhji, how you would have dealt with the current issues like corruption, Annaji and other things? I will A, never be. B, I will never get into politics. C, I'm the last person for you guys to want because I would start executing. I don't mean executing projects, but start executing people. I'm a great believer that is desh mein na lato ke bhoot baato se mante. There needs to be swift justice. You know, we are making a joke. Do you know what the first charge against Kasab is? That he entered VT without a platform ticket. I mean, that's a bloody joke on the so-called justice that we keep talking about. Any other country would have hung him ages ago. We feed him biryani, we make him celebrate all the festivals. You know, so he's, he's a bigger state guest than some of the other guys here. So I don't know what I'd do. I'd, I don't know. And frankly, I don't think that far. Excuse me. So since you said that you visit rural India five times uh, in a working week, I would like to know your view on the army of uh, educated youth which India is generating, which is unemployable. In the sense, people are... Brilliant. Yeah. So I have got on to 
a board called a company called NSDC, which is the National Skills Development Corporation, and I'm chairing the NSDC's Marketing and Communications Committee, and I may add for free, where we are launching a huge campaign which you will see roll out in around the middle of January. It's been all settled. The whole idea is, as you very rightly say, and I mentioned this fleetingly, education is equal to a degree which is not necessarily equal to employment. But skills or hunar, which we must encourage, we don't. Now, as a marketing person, when I looked at the exercise and my meeting was directly with the Prime Minister and I told him, I said, look, there are two things that are wrong. It is not about convincing the young to become a plumber or an electrician or a, or a nurse or whatever. You also have to convince the parents through society. Because what happens is, there is enormous parental peer pressure. A mother doesn't want to tell her neighbor, ki yaar mere larke ne college chhod ke ab wo plumber banega. Because we have created artificial levels of respect with things that don't necessarily mean a lot in real life. A, B, as a society, we have been hierarchical for so long that we've treated education as the first step in, hi in that hierarchy rather than real and raw talent. So unless you change that, you're going to get into this, this minefield. So it's a very, very good question that you've asked. Hopefully, well, what we are aiming for is 20 million by 2020. Their corporate India, I must say, has done a creditable job. Many of India's leading corporations have agreed to set up skills institutes, many of which are up and running. So I, I think there are some planned even in Madhya Pradesh if they don't already exist. I'm, I'm not familiar with each geography, but I know it's being rolled out. There's a very good guy running NSDC, a guy called Dilip Shinoy, who used to run Siam. So, you know, see, but this is the point I'm making. You tell a television channel to run a program on, on skills, but you tell them to run a, a program on some Ashleelta or some item number, they'll run it first. So we've got our national priorities wrong as well. Okay? Any more? Uh, which, 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 would you, which would be the books that have left its mark on you that you would have read? Very quickly. But actually, I read about six books a week. <coughs> so let's go back in time. You must read... How many of you read? Because then I'm going to start a quiz and huh? that'll be dangerous. Mondays with Maury. Anyone read it? Two. That's, it? that's it. Who said that? Mitch Album. Read Richard Bach, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Read every play by Shakespeare. He's the finest psychologist the world has ever known. But if you want my f top five plays in this order. Read Julius Caesar to know about human vanity, greed, and absolute power. Read Macbeth, read Othello, read Richard II, read Richard III. And if you really want to see how our politicians will one day turn out, read King Lear. So that's Shakespeare. You must read Arms and the Man by Bernard Shaw. You must read The Seer Who Walks Alone by Popul Jaika, which is on Jiddu Krishnamurti. You must read The Idea of Justice by Amartya Sen. Uh, what are the others? There are several, yeah. You know, it's a damn difficult. Now I'm trying to, in my mind, I'm trying to slot them in categories to make it easier for you guys. Uh, Read Rushdie's latest, Joseph Anton, very good book. Read An Equal Music by Vikram Se. See, I travel lots of categories, so I'm not the best person. But read a goddamn newspaper and see the best-selling list. <laughs> very good book. So well, there would be a, one last question. It would only be unfair if I didn't uh, say that is uh, when the Prime Minister was aware of the 2G scam, why did he keep silent? What's your opinion? I think political compulsions. Manmohan Singh would 
actually know the enormity. For that you need to blame him. The fact that he was either ignorant or condoning or it happened under his watch, you need to blame him for that. But to say he was part of that, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I think he's a good man and we are blessed to have a good prime minister. By and large, this country has had good prime ministers. The two rascals we had, Deva Gauda slept most of the time, so he created no harm. And Indira Gandhi, thankfully, is dead. So, you know, we are safe by and large. Just a last one, uh, Mr. Sohail. Uh, what is it that you would, uh, uh, you would, you would probably, uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm talking about Rajat Gupta, that uh, what prompted him to take this particular step when he had, when he had everything in life, you know? I mean, what is the kind of, um, uh, it's a psychological five, thing would it's, have... It's a yeah. five-letter word, begins with G. That's greed you're talking? Yeah. No, Super. but uh, again, as I told you, he had all the number of years and still, uh, if you say that greed has, has overpowered, it's something that is very hard to digest. You know, you're it. here because of one apple. I'm not talking about iPods. So the forbidden fruit is equally tempting. It's simply greed, as simple. You know, let's not put any virtues to that. Oh, yaar, ye bada thinker tha, ye wo. He lived and moved with people who were much wealthier. He was far brighter than them. He said, yaar, inke paas itne millions of dollars hai, why the hell should I not make money? And, you know, to give him the benefit of doubt, which I've never publicly given, he must have made a mistake. But as Judge Ratkoff said, that great human beings are able to arrest impending crises only by understanding the enormity of the flaw. But that's why I'm saying read Shakespeare. If you look at Julius Caesar, it's not about Caesar. It's about hubris and catharsis. If you read King Lear and the way King Lear ends where he says, pray do not mock me, I'm but an old and foolish man. So it's the acceptance and the understanding of the environment you're in that often compels you to do things you do. I mean, the world has been created through fatal flaws. For those of you who are religious, if you read the Bible and you look at the Last Supper and what happened? So, you know, I mean, I'm not religious, but I understand the impact that religion may have on consumerism or sociology. You look at the way Judaism spread. Or if you go into Jewish history, there are compulsions that you and I can't understand. So there's a brilliant book by Paul Johnson called History of the Jews, where he begins by saying that the Jews forever have only fought for one thing, because they were tribal, nomadic, and homeless. For them, land, and therefore Hebron, was the starting point. Contrast that to a brilliant book written by Naipaul called Beyond Belief where V.S. Naipaul argues about Islam and he says that Islam is a faith and not a religion because it makes the believers speak in one language, single place of worship. And friends, sir. Means you call someone up at 2 a.m. saying I'm in trouble and he won't ask why, where, when. He'll just be there. Simple. Right. There's no major intellectual reason for that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Seth. Uh, now, the most powerful and proactive session concludes. Uh, Suhail has been uh, kind enough to accept to be a part of our mentor board. May I request our chairman, Mr. Ravi Mohan, to come and give him a moment. to present the memento of our guest. Please, Mr. Dave. Thanks. May I request Mr. Praveen Agarwal, Joint Secretary, Indore Management Association, and Director of Admin Packing Limited. 
good evening engaged enraged indifferent three kinds of citizens said mr seth in most of the cases sir so are the audiences but thanks to a dynamic and unconventional talk today all of us in the audience was totally engaged you made us not only hear but listen and registered each and every word it was an overwhelming session and an enriching experience that everyone sitting in the audience today was privileged to attend mr seth i feel extremely honored to take this opportunity on behalf of indoor management association to thank you for accepting our invitation and making special efforts to reschedule again and again your program to be with us in indoor today and sharing your thoughts straight from the heart it was a truly thrilling session thank you i am grateful to the audience for their participation thank you all for joining us and now may i invite all of us you all of you for cocktails and dinner thank you, thank you so much.